Welcome back to A Fine Time for Healing, a place where your physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being are all that matter. I am your host, Randy Fine. Today we have with us Robert Lindsay Milne, who is a psychic, intuitive counselor, teacher, healer, and life coach. And he is going to discuss his life and helping people through his gifts. There are um, two really interesting stories that he's going to tell us that are just fascinating. Um, and he is featured in a book called The Perfect Predator, which he's going to tell us about. Um, let's see. Robert is recognized across the continent as one of the most insightful psychic intuitive counselors of his time. At a very young age, he realized his psychic gifts and started his first job working as a psychic intuitive doing readings at the Cozy Tea Room in Toronto. He's traveled the world um, and he's going to tell us more about himself as we get going, but this is going to be so fascinating. Um, welcome, Robert. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to uh, being on your show. Thank you. Thank you. I've been looking forward to having you. So you're, we're going to start with, I know you do many things, but I know that you're a psychic and I am. is this something that came to you naturally? It's something that definitely came to me naturally. Um, I didn't understand that other people didn't see, couldn't see, wouldn't see, or sense the things that I was, was seeing. And I was seeing and sensing things at a very, very young age. And I got into a lot of trouble for the things that I was um, seeing. And um, one of my very first remembrances, um, I was around five or six years old. And I had just come home from school for lunch. It was either kindergarten or grade one. And I said to my mother, Grandma Harris died today. And that was in 1955. And my Grandma Harris was my great grandmother. I was living in Toronto, Canada. And uh, Grandma Harris was living in England. And I'd only seen her once in my entire life. And all of a sudden, one day I came home and said, Grandma Harris died. My mother got very angry with me and yelled at me and even hit me for saying bad things again. And um, the next night at dinner, because time, you know, people, you know, news traveled slowly in the 1950s. You didn't make long distance telephone calls in the 1950s. You got a a, um, a, um, a message for, at your front door, a telegram telling you somebody died, you, you know, the day before. And um, so the next night at dinner, this was my father, my mother, myself and my sister. My mother said to my father, Grandma Harris died yesterday. And I thought my father was going to yell at my mother and hit her for saying bad things. And they talked about it instead. And and I, I, I can't remember at six years old what my feelings were, except I knew something was weird. And over time, I noticed that I was saying things and getting into trouble and, and not realizing why I was getting into trouble. Uncle Harold, that wasn't Aunt Sally. Who was that woman? Well, that one got me in trouble for sure. Oh, wow. um, and I didn't understand. And and um, I, I, I started just keeping my mouth shut because I kept getting hit so much. And um, I was about nine and my father took me to an NHL Stanley Cup hockey game. And uh, Toronto and Boston, by the way. And and um, the game was tied 1-1. It went into overtime. And when the teams came on the ice for the first overtime period, I knew number 17 with Toronto Maple Leafs was going to score. It wasn't that he was going to score. In my mind, he already had scored, yet the game hadn't started. Anyway, in this building that night, it was 1957, by the way, March. It was it was March 1957. And and um, the building, there's about 20,000 people in the building. 
The lights went down just as the referee was about to drop the puck. I couldn't hold my feelings in anymore. And I jumped up and started to yell and scream and cheer because Gary Eamon had, was going to score the winning goal, but the game <laughs> hadn't started. Randy, the entire building <laughs> turned and looked at me and my dad. And, and he said, sit down. And I did. And then, and then, you know, the referee dropped the puck. Uh, by the way, Gary Eamon wasn't even on the ice then. Anyways, <laughs> The game started um, a couple of shifts later, uh, Gary Eamon jumped over the boards and a guy named Red Kelly passed the puck to him and Eamon tipped the puck in the net and scored the winning overtime <laughs> goal. The entire building erupted. The light, you know, the flashlights were going off. Everybody was yelling and screaming and cheering. And I just stood there looking around the building and I realized then that other people weren't seeing what I was seeing. I was so I was about nine years old when I knew, and, and, and I knew then somehow this is what I would be doing um, in my life. Then that was when I I knew. Yeah, and it, it's wonderful. I didn't know what it was called. Mm -hmm. But it's right. wonderful yeah, that you know embraced it, it. It's wonderful that you embraced it because um, I've talked to several people who are in whether psychic or medium or whatever that recognize it as ch uh, in ch childhood but like didn't want to do it and went a different way and then ended up doing it again so it seems as if this was something that you were fascinated with and you were able to continue to do it so this is all you've ever done right it's pretty much all I've ever done. I've, I've I celebrated fifty eight years of being a professional psychic um, on uh, ja last January. That's awesome. And and now I've had very interesting avocations, but I've never actually worked at anything else other than uh, be being a psychic. Okay. Although I've I've had you know you know extreme um, avocations. Right. Well, for as well. to people like me, and I'm sure many of my listeners, it's this is very fascinating because it's not something that comes naturally to us. I understand that we can learn to do it, uh, that we can mm -hmm. all learn to do it. But to be able to have that initially, uh, to be aware that you have this, it is a gift. Um, it's just very, very fascinating to all of us. Uh, do you do just psychic work or do you do mediumship or channeling or anything like that i don't put a label on what i do um i've i've never really focused on am i a medium am i a psychic am i an intuitive uh, uh am i clairvoyant uh, what i look for is giving the person in front of me the answer and and uh, to to what the, uh, um so I haven't really concentrated on, and by the way I, I I haven't really hung around very many psychics and and I just simply do what needs to be done in in that moment. Okay. What I have discovered um, in the last several years is that um, I was uh, remote viewing as a child, but not knowing I was remote viewing. Oh. Um, I was sensing spirits. I didn't know that I was sensing spirits. I was seeing the future. I didn't know that that's what I was doing. I was just giving the information. Um, so so I, I don't put very many labels on, on that. Right. But you know, so mediums, mediums are able to connect with the other side. And so it, am I correct sure. in assuming that you can do that as well? It's um, you can assume that um, it, it's I'm I'm mostly conscious when okay. I do my work. OK, very good. Uh, OK, so we're going to I want you to tell the story that is told in the book, The Perfect Predator. Um, and, you know, and when I say the word predator, it's, it's interesting because I do uh, I'm a narcissistic abuse expert and coach. Um, and so thank you I, for that work you do. You have done welcome. so much for people. Thank You're you. Welcome. So uh, when when I think of predators, I think of people who prey yes. on other people. 
That's not what this story is about. It's about a different kind of predator, yeah. correct? It is. It is. It's about a different kind of predator. So it's about us. um it's it's uh, a superbug. Now, um I just have to say that um I'm not the star of this show. However, had a psychic not been involved, um, the guy that uh, became infected with the superbug would have died. Okay. Um, the, the two people involved, um, Dr. Stephanie Strathy um, is a Toronto woman. She is a renowned epidemiologist. She came to me for her very first psychic reading. She had just finished her PhD. So it was more than 30 years ago. And she did a, had a reading for me in, in, in Toronto. Um, she's currently now um, a professor of um, epidemiology at the University of California. Um, and she is um, a leading expert in the research of, in studies of AIDS and things like that. Her husband, Tom, um, also is a professor of um, experimental psychology at, at the same university and is also an associate dean of, of that department. And um, these people are um, uh, very well known uh, in, in, in their respective fields. And they've been clients of mine for a long time. Um, I was doing a reading for Tom uh, um, a year and a half or so before this event occurred. And Tom, I think of, a, he, you know, he is like a, um, uh, uh, an older uh, uh, Indiana Jones kind of guy. Yeah, you know, he's like six foot five. He's like really macho. He's really smart. And, and a lot of his work has been research in the jungle. And and um, he got uh, kidnapped by the Sandinistas in the 1980s and was in a concentration camp and just about starved to death and survived it. And, and um, you know, he's really had a, an, an interesting, fabulous background life. Um, although Tom got way out of shape, got over 300 pounds and was really slowing down. And I did a reading for him. But as I said, about a year and a half or so before this event occurred. And I said to him, and when I give bad news, and I don't like to do, I don't like giving bad news, but I do. And the way I do it is um, when I'm sensing something negative, I look forward into the future and I look at the positive result of the negative event. Mm, okay. And what I do is I tell them about the positive result, about the negative event, but I don't tell them about the negative event. Mm -hmm. And I talk about the positive experience. And then I'll come back to the present and I'll just drop a hint, you know, just like a little rosebud. And then and then um, I'll go far back into the future, talk about the positive thing and a few other things. Then I come back to the present and I expand upon the negative thing. And sometimes I'll take 35 or 40 minutes to get to the point. But when I do readings, by the way, I'm constantly moving forward and backward in time. And when I tune into somebody, I see their life from conception to completion. Wow. And 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 now I don't see the fine details at either end. You know, I just sort of see where the energy line starts. And and throughout people's readings, I am going through the future and the past and the present. And I'm constantly doing that through, through the, the, the sessions. Um, so I had been telling Tom about, uh, and, and what I said to him is that um, in two and a half years, he was going to lose more than a hundred pounds and he want to get in a whole new wardrobe. And, and I talked about that. And then I came back and, and I mentioned that there was a, you know, a bit of an infection happening, a change of subject. And then as I spread it out over that hour, I then got to the point where I said, and you are going to get so sick. Now, I didn't do this right away. I built up to it. You will get so sick that you cannot get sicker without dying. And, and I said, uh, and if you do get sick, you'll lose more than 100 pounds. And then I said to him, it seems like um it's up to you you can pay attention to the warning i've given you and you can take care of yourself physically 
or you can do nothing, get sick, get as close to dying as you possibly can without dying, lose a hundred pounds and start again. Wow. And, and, and now that was that, that's really condensed. It took me a long time to get to it. And it scared him for a bit, you know, a week or two. And he, you know, ate grapes and lettuce for a week and then changed. It didn't, then, then he went back to his old ways. Tom and Stephanie go away on their dream vacation. Uh, and by the way, he had had some abdominal problems that I had told him about earlier any, as well. So they go to they go to Egypt. They're going through this pyramid. Tom's really, really sick before he gets there, collapses in the pyramid. They carry him out. He goes back to the hotel. The doctor comes and they rush him to the hospital in Cairo. And he had now we get into the medical stuff he had what was called a pseudo cyst on his pancreas i don't know what the hell that is it was sick anyway so that's all i saw was it was sick um that got infected by the superbug and the superbug that he contacted was the most potent superbug on the planet and it was 100 percent antibiotic resistant and that meant that when you get it you die Tom went into a coma and was in a coma for eight months. And um, he was medevac from uh, Cairo to um, Germany. And, and Stephanie was, was with him. And so he was in isolation um, and, and, and locked in. And then, then Stephanie had called me just after that. And, and it was during near Christmas and she called me on Skype and uh, I crawled out of bed and I, and I, and when I answered the Skype line, I said, what took you so long? I've been waiting to hear from you. That's the first thing. I, Cause I'd been waiting for her to hear from her because I knew something had gone wrong with Tom. And um, she told me what had happened. And I said, well, Tom isn't going to die. Um, he's going to get as sick as he possibly can, but he's not going to die. And and there was no cure for this this um, uh, uh, superbug, and I told Stephanie that she could find a cure, that it was possible, and I created a psychic link with Tom, a mental psychic link, and I was in psychic contact with him, twenty four hours a day, seven days a week for eight months, and I lived what he was going through and i knew when tom was weak i knew when he was letting go i knew when he was in going into septic shock i knew i knew and sensed what he was feeling the, the whole time i was also tuned into stephanie and she and i had meetings every day about what was going on with tom i told her that she could find the cure and and Stephanie is an alpha alpha woman, and um, she just decided that she was going to find the cure. And Stephanie put together uh, a group of the most brilliant scientists on the planet. And in that collaboration, they found the cure for that superbug. I was in contact with Stephanie and with Tom. And there was one period where, um, so I visualized a candle and the candle was lit and I saw that as Tom's life force. And as long as the candle was burning and it was strong, the flame, I knew he was okay. He wasn't gonna die that minute. And there was one day I woke up and the candle looked like it was gonna blow out. It was it, it 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 shocked the hell out of me, and I said to Stephanie in our meeting, I said, "Tom is in Christ." Well, he was going into septic shock then. It, he went through septic shock seven times while he was in a coma. Um, anyway, I I, I said, I, "Tom uh, can hear voices, and Tom can hear the people around him." He didn't know where he was. He 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 was hallucinating. He he was in isolation but he could hear people telling him he was going to die or he was hearing the doctors and the nurses talking. Um, he was cold. He didn't know where he was. He didn't understand what was happening and he was letting go. The man was dying. And I said, to, I said to Stephanie, 
Tom needs to see his daughters. Yesterday would have been good. Today is good. Tomorrow's not that good. If you wait longer, don't bother. That night, his daughters arrived from California. And I didn't know that they were coming, but they arrived in California that night. But what I saw, though, was the flame went from flickering to going out to the flame came on. In it. And, and that was when I knew the girls arrived. That's in the book. Now, there are a lot of psychics on the planet that could have done what I did. But what's most important is that in that work, it was proven that if a psychic hadn't have been on the job, Tom would have died. And, and there were three different times where if a psychic hadn't have been doing the work he would have died Medis the medical field would have lost him um anyway tom then or then you know he recovered um and then over the next several months he just got sicker and sicker and stephanie set out to find the cure and um so he recovered I and then she found a cure again well she only found one cure okay um but but this was early on when okay. he was in in that was an okay. early uh okay. he would have died then right uh, okay so over time she found and and as i said i was having meetings with her every day as well and and um she she had narrowed it down to three different options and the first one she said is phages and she was running it by me. She ran everything by me, um, but she had other uh, other people too. Um, and I said, that's the one. And, and she said, well, let me tell you about the other two. And I said, well, that's the one. And she said, I'm telling you about the other two. And she told me about the second one. And I said, phages is the one. Phages. And then she, phages is what it's called. And then she said, well, let me tell you about the third one. And then she again told me about the third one. And I said, it's the first one, it's phages. And she said, why? And I said, because it's like a little Pac-Man and it will attack the superbug, kill it and eat it. And she said, that's what it does. Now, based on all the scientific research she had done and that last bit of information, she chose phages. And um, no human had ever been um, injected with phages previously. Phages are harvested from sewer water, and what it is is excrement, incidentally. This, not, this is a real true story. And um, there, were, there was research done in the 1930s and 20s in Russia of, of these experiments. They were injecting, this is sounds weird, they were injecting fresh stool in people who had... Um, lower uh, bowel issues and the concept was the, the the healthy bacteria will destroy the unhealthy bacteria that was the concept in that era and and they were getting some success but it stopped when penicillin was invented because you know people got the opportunity of a turd or a pill so they took the pill and so penicillin got invented and and phage, phage therapy stopped she found that, and then the process was getting it put through and 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 leak and and brought into the country, um, and and he was treated. So um, that's how phages got. And Tom was the very first person to be to be um, injected in his uh, IV with with phages. And Incidentally, so that was that that he that was like he was within hours of dying. Um, before he got treated so now they have this cure for the superbug they is this uh, well it, it indeed so and 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 um it's changed how medicine is treating other diseases as well by using things that that are non-chemical that will attack um an infection and and kill it yeah. and and that was the, that's how it happened how is tom doing today 
He's alive. He's well. Um, he's he's um, semi-retired as a professor. He's writing his books and 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 being professorly. I just talked to Stephanie and Tom a couple of days ago. Um, so when someone is in a coma, yes, they are, they are absolutely they, they can hear. Is that the only sense that they have? I I um, I'm not sure about that. What what I really was sure about or focused on was is, is is Tom still alive? What's he going through? Um, how's he reacting? And during that time, I also was anticipating um, when he was going into crises, and and I was um, a day or two ahead of the doctors. I would say, you know, this is going on, and ta -da, ta -da. and then and then like two or three days later, that would come up. And and what also was interesting was I was using different colloquialisms, you, you, you know, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And, and then like two days later, the doctor said to Stephanie, you got to and I was telling her, you got to slow down, look after yourself. This is, a, you know, this isn't a marathon, it's a sprint. And the head doctor said, Stephanie, you've got to slow down. This is a marathon, not a sprint. And and as I said, I was two or three days ahead of what the doctors were saying. Fascinating. Wow. And I, I lived through it um, for over a year and Tom lived off my energy. Really? That's, yeah. that's, that's amazing. Um, he must be so grateful for so many things to be alive and to have known you. In there were so many other people on the project that um, Tom is grateful for and to. And, and um, I, um, that it was, it was something magical and, and world changing and, and my part, like, like I always said, you, you know, I'm not the main event. I wasn't the star. I'm not the star, right. but a psychic on the job saved the man's life. And that means other people, my people can do those things too. Right. That's what I'm proud of. Mm -hmm. Wow. Have you, have you done any, how long ago did this happen? Um, around 2015, 2016. Right. Have you seen anything of anything even remotely close since then? like that and that that level well right where somebody you knew somebody was going to be sick and you oh okay so um yes um so healing stuff isn't my forte uh, it, it, it's not what i'm i'm i i i'm well healing in um in in behavior or or um psychological wounds emotional wounds traumas that's my forte that's what i'm really into um and and um understanding how we process and how we're and and in my life coaching i help people um get control when their brain is in 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 panic mode mm -hmm. and and I, I i do those things psychically okay and when someone's going through the a, a trauma i'll talk to them about i'll get them to identify what they're feeling in the moment and and, and identifying their body and, and 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 then getting back back in 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 control that's really what i get okay. really turned right. on to it's very similar to what i do that's, well, that's I why do. i was without that's why i was that's why I was telling it. Yeah, without the uh, psychic part, because I don't. You know, actually, I really shouldn't say that because there is um, there is some downloading that I get from, about people that just sort of comes through me. So I guess I am really guiding them from you know from another source. So um, I do do that. Mm -hmm every uh, almost everyone um has psychic ability so the key word is almost if if we took everyone on the planet and lined them up from one you know like in in a bell-shaped curve at one end of that bell-shaped curve one person has absolutely zero awareness 
And then at the other end of that bell-shaped curve, there is one person that has absolutely 100% awareness. And the rest of us uh, um, mammals um, are, are, are somewhere in between. And it is a natural phenomenon for we humans and other mammals um, to have instincts, intuitions, um, call it psychic ability, if, 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 if you wish. And and it's just part of us. It, it 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 has there ever been a time you're at a restaurant or something and you just sort of turn your head and you look and there's somebody just been looking at you. Mm -hmm. That's being psychic. That right. that is it. So or you're driving you, somebody drives by and all of a sudden you look. That's correct. Right. That's right. Okay. Now almost everybody can do that. And when I teach a class, I'm going to be doing that soon. When I teach people to be psychic, so I say almost everybody can be, because almost everybody is. There's some that can't be. And what I ask people to do is I say, become aware of what's obvious. Look at the person. Use your senses. See that being. Uh, when you become aware of what's obvious, then more becomes obvious. And as you become more aware of what's obvious, then even more becomes obvious again. Until eventually your awareness gets you know, spread to a point where what seems obvious to you isn't obvious to others. Oh, wow. And that's the first step in being a psychic. Okay. And and what I ask people to do is get in touch with your senses. So touch, taste, smell, see, hear. We have these five senses. When we use these five senses, we then create a sixth sense. Uh, by the way, that's called ESP. Yeah. extra sensory <laughs> perception right. right and and when you become a, mm -hmm. uh, 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 aware of your senses and focus on what's obvious then we go to the next level mm -hmm. but it's something that we all fundamentally have if we want to work almost everybody if you want to work out it right i'm going to try that i like that please do <laughs> so I know that you have other stories and you um, there was a situation where you had direct contact with a KGB agent. Tell yes, I did. How was that? Well, story? Okay. now this was very early in my career. Now, I, you know, I started um, at, at, at the cozy tea room in in um, 1956. 1965. Sorry, I got my, I, I, I have dyslexia. I got the 1965. How old um, were you at in 1965? 15 and a half. Okay. All right. And I was living on the street. I was homeless and I survived on the street using my instincts, my intuition and psychic ability. Not only did I survive, but I um, looked after people as well because I was always be able to find where there was food. I always could find where there was a place to sleep that would be safe. And 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 even as a child, I was looking after people on the street. And again, just with my intuitions and psychic ability. And and um, there were many times where I was put in a position where I could solve the problem by using my psychic ability, intuition or an illegal or immoral act. And there's no right or wrong choice. Um, what the choice was, I didn't know these things. I know them now. Um, the choice was my life would turn out a certain way if I did things a certain way. Um, and almost always I used my intuition and psychic ability to solve the problem. I very, very seldom ever did things differently. I never did anything illegal on a snowy winter's night. Um, children get into trouble sometimes and mm -hmm. you have to do things, um, but they were not mm -hmm. illegal. Um, um, there were things I had to do, but that didn't happen very often. And 
when I heard that at the cozy tea room, this and in those days being doing readings was against the law. And and um, the way people did readings is they sold a cup of tea and a sandwich and um, for two fifty, and you got a tea leaf and a card reading for um, entertainment. Mm -hmm. And I heard that if you worked at the cozy tea room and if you worked there in the afternoon, you would get a cup of tea, a sandwich, cookies, and you'd get paid for the shift. And if you worked at night, you got a hot dinner, a cup of tea, sandwich, and a cookie, and you got paid. And I applied there that day, and, and, and it was a cold January day, and I applied. And the way I got the job was I did a reading for the owner. And I, I had never read tea leaves, and I'd never read cards. And and I had to do that. So I just held the teacup in my hand, and I picked it up, and I held it like this in front of me. And I uh, pretended I was looking in the teacup and I just looked at Mrs. Cox and I told her what came into my mind. And then I put the cards down. I had no idea what the cards meant. You know, I would just talk. Tarot, and... tarot cards? No, they were just, they were just um, playing cards. Okay. And, and um, I just put them down on the table and continued talking. And I'd point to the seven of hearts. I had no bloody idea what the seven of hearts meant. <laughs> but I would just say, and the seven of hearts, and I'd point to it. And, you know, I was a flip art kid, you know, when I was. And, and I just incorporated that. And on that day, I got hired. You bs your I, way through the whole thing. <laughs> I, I, I what? You bs your way. Well, I was doing what I always do. I was doing readings. I just wasn't using the tea leaves right. or the, I, I just, I, I had to do it. Like right. I, I'm hold, right now I'm holding a magic wand, right? I got this wand. Well, I don't wave a magic wand for, and make magic tricks. I just hold it. Um, over here, I have a, a crystal ball. Do you see it there? Yes, I yeah. do. I see okay, it. Okay. Well, I've had that for like, 45 years I've never read it never really? used it but it sat beside me my 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 stepdaughter when I got it when she looked she was like about six or seven and she looked at it and she said how do you make it work <laughs> <laughs> and uh so so um I just simply did readings and and I said what I needed to say um I started working that day you know I had a hot meal and um I got paid and I had a warm place to sleep that night. And I worked at the cozy tea room for almost seven years. And where I were you worked... sleeping? They provided a place for you to sleep. No, I had money to, to rent a okay. to rent a, a room for that night. Okay. Good. And and I worked there. Um and and I worked there five days a week, six days a week, sometimes seven days a week. And I would see people. Some days there would be 35 or 40. Some days there would be 10 or 12. But I was there every day. And and um, and I practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. And I and, and at about 21, I left the cozy tea room. Well, the universe certainly provided for you. Uh, the uh, yes, indeed. Um, see, mm. I, I think about those things because mm. yes, the the universe did provide, but I chose to receive it. Yes, I didn't say, "Oh, woe is me," or "Or I I don't know what to do," or I focused on what can I do. And and for me, it was how do I survive? And I learned that if I survive by helping other people survive then i'm going to be okay and 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 my instinct is what can i do rather than what can i get right I so, mean, and that's so interesting yeah i mean because i've talked on this show a lot about um following the signposts and recognizing when something is in front of you that is leading you Absolutely. In the direction that to the path of least resistance or where you need to go and so yes you have to recognize it absolutely and you did absolutely. that's right and and it came to me and i and i chose to and i made the choice so at about 21 when i left the tea room um i used to get fired a lot too i was you know i wasn't that you know i was a pretty wild kid and 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 um i it really bothered me at the tea room because I saw how poorly 
the people that were doing readings were living. And they were old and they were burned out and they were poor. Um, and, and the tea room charged $2 and 50 cents and the reader got a dollar and the tea room got a dollar 50. Um, I'm not very good with math. I have trouble still today. I have trouble reading letters and words. Um, I still am functionally illiterate. I, I can read a bit, but I, I still am disabled that way. Okay. But I figured out very quickly that a dollar fifty was more than 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 a dollar, and and I th saw these people, the owners, making a living off of my people, my kind, um, and they were doing better than us. And if it wasn't for us, they wouldn't be doing better. So I I I for a while there got a little bit resentful and often would get fired or quit or, but I was so successful there, you know, I'd quit and she'd phone me and, you know, call me back or, you know, I'd phone and, you know, can I come back? It was usually right as it was near rent day. One of us called each other, you know, and then I came back and worked again. And, and then, and then another blow up would happen. And, and at around 21, I just said, that's it. And I heard that if a young man becomes a priest, when they um, they make a vow to say a mass every day of their life. And when I was around 21, I made a vow that I would do a psychic reading or practice being psychic every day of my life. And I made it for 30 years, a little more than 30 years without missing a day of practice or doing a reading. And, and um, I did it when I was sick, when I was, you know, fine, healthy, unhealthy, happy, sad. And, and I, I um, didn't miss a day for more than 30 years. Then I missed a day. I wanted to know what it felt like not to do it. <laughs> that was your cheat day. Like, like when you're on a diet, you know, you have a cheat That's day. Right. That was yeah. your cheat day. Yeah, I'd won every 30 years. Right. <laughs> so we... Um, we sort of got off track, but I was, you know, I was asking you about this KG. Oh, the Mount, the Mountie. Okay. Mm, so, so tell us what happened. Okay. So um, mm. now I was in my uh, 25, 26. Um, and I was, I had learned that I could do phone in radio shows and I was doing remote viewing on call in shows and things like that. And um, in those days you had to be physically in the studio they didn't have like what right. we're doing now. Right. And and I started um going to cities out or going to radio stations outside of Toronto. And 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 um I was going to Ottawa to audition for a spot on a radio show. And I, I went to Ottawa, did the show um and got the part. And 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 I was on that station every month for almost 12 years. Um and when I got back to Toronto, the program director phoned me. And he said, um, we got a phone call. And there's an interesting the sirens going by right now. Um, we got a he, he got a phone call from this guy. His first name was Yvonne. And um he was he in in Ottawa and he worked at the Soviet embassy in, in Ottawa. And he was a journalist with TAS News Agency although he lived at the uh, at the uh, embassy and he had diplomatic passport. And, and he called the radio station, spoke to the program director, and he wanted to have a reading from me. And the program director phoned me and I just said, leave me alone. I don't want anything to do with this guy. Just stay <laughs> away. I don't, I'm not interested. And, um, and in those days you couldn't find anybody because we only had, um, um, phone book. So why were you not interested? I didn't want to do. A, I didn't want to be involved with the spy. I. I. It was. It was beyond my ken, as it were. So. I, it so he was a spy. Oh yes. Um. So what? What then happened is, um, unbeknownst to me, the program director informed the RCMP security service that this guy had contacted me. I didn't know that. So I'm back in Toronto and I start getting phone calls from friends and friends were saying, um, we've been getting this 
these calls from this Mountie um, inquiring about you. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, you know, and I was getting nervous. And then the guy called me and he introduced himself. He was Sergeant whatever. Um, I I remember his name. I'm just not going to give it out. Um, and and um, he said that um, he wanted to have a conversation with me about a non-criminal matter. And could he and his partner come and talk to me? And and once again, I said, is that about that guy in Ottawa? And he said, yes. And I said, I don't want to be involved. Leave me alone. Like, like I, I can't do this. And then, you know, I got the routine, you know, you're going to do a favor for your country and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I was in my 20s. I thought, OK, I'll do that. And anyway, they showed up at my office and um, I did a couple of things for them. And I came up with a name that wasn't involved, that this guy wasn't his, this guy's name. But I came up with another name and the two Mounties, they got their their their, their face turned white and they said, nobody knows that yeah. and 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 they said you are either psychic or you're involved in this and and uh, anyway um they told me that this man had spent most of his life in washington as a journalist living at the embassy in washington and he had the diplomatic passport and this was at the end of the Brezhnev era and Brezhnev was losing power. And this guy got transferred from just out of the blue from Washington to Ottawa. That is not a promotion. That is a major demotion. And in essence, he thought that he was going to get called back to Moscow and then end up in Siberia. And the Mounties thought that he wanted to defect. That's what they thought. And they wanted me to meet him, to do a reading for him because they thought he was reaching out. And a few, I then agreed to do it. And then um, the next time I was going to Ottawa, I let the guy, the radio station told the guy that I was coming into town. And and the Mounties had booked a, a hotel for me. They picked me up at my home the day we were flying there. And like I'm standing beside these two guys are like six foot three. And I'm like, you know, five foot six. And and these two giants are beside me. We were on a government plane. We flew to Ottawa and we got to this hotel. Um, and the room I was in was wired, and then there was another room adjoined to it, and, and there were all kinds of, you know, three or four Mounties in that room, and it was all wired. And then and then they 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 um, gave me this guy's background. And that was the first time in my life and the only time I ever allowed myself to be influenced by information before doing a reading. And as I was doing a reading for the guy, it turned out that the information was wrong. So what they wanted me to do is tell him somewhere in the middle of the reading that, um, and it was something like this, because this was like 50 years ago. Um, it was something like, if if um, sometimes we find ourselves in trouble and sometimes we discover that we have friends we didn't know we had. That was what I was supposed to say to him or something like that. So I'm doing a reading for this guy and it's on being recorded and everything on my cassette. And I, and I say to him what I was supposed to say. And he stood up, turned around and just walked out. He didn't say goodbye, didn't say, he just left and he was gone. And and anyway, the guys came in the room to me and, and I said, I, I think I ruined it. And they said, no, you didn't. Um, when you talk to these people, if you imply anything to do with defecting, that's what they do. They just get up and walk away. They just run away. And then he said, we may never know what 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 what's going to happen now. All right. So that that's the mount that that's in touch with Moranov. OK, that's the guy. All right. So now um, I get back to Toronto and the guy again, the first guy calls me and he said, can you find things? Oh, yeah, OK, I can find things. And he said, well, the greatest amount of intelligence 
being passed in the world today is between the border at Niagara Falls in uh, uh, on Canada and the United States. And there's more intelligence being passed there than anywhere in the world. Yeah. And he said, we're watching that area and we are constantly looking for dead letter boxes. And a dead letter box is where they pass information. And, and he said, can you, could you find them? I didn't know, but I said yes. And um, a couple of weeks later, I went down to Niagara Falls. We, I went into the station. We looked at maps of the of the parks, and I put my hand over the top of a map. Uh, now we're in 1977 or something, 76, right? and I was putting my hand over the top of maps, and and I would feel something a uh, heat. And then we went out into the park, and and we'd go to those areas. And I went down there every month for almost two years and um, found several um, dead letter boxes. And there was one time when I came down and we were out in the middle of the park and as we were walking around, the guy said to me, you know, your Russian friend. And I said, yeah. He said, it worked out. I never knew whatever happened after that. I, that's all I knew. That's all they told me. I, it, 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 it worked out. And- so, so the dead letter box, did that contain anything? Oh, absolutely. boxes and yes. They they found a lot of intelligence. Okay. Yes, that's right. So cool. Uh, what, have you ever been called in for a missing person? Several different times. In Canada, um, up until um, July first, uh, two thousand and nineteen. Um, telling fortunes for a consideration it was part of the um, witchcraft act and you could get uh, you could go to jail for that that it that was enacted in um, the late 1800s and it was on the books and and um, uh, I never got busted but and oh incidentally on January 1st or sorry July 1st of uh, 2019 um, both cannabis and fortune telling were legal on the same were, were made <laughs> legal i i don't know this the connection there but but they happened at the same time i guess okay. you can tell fortunes and smoke dope too and you're safe you don't go to jail <laughs> and and uh um so um uh um i i just trying to remember what i was what i was talking about though i i got lost on um uh missing persons missing. missing persons so I was the first Canadian psychic to appear on radio and TV shows as a performer. And I was the first one to tour. And, and in those days, I would travel from city to city going on radio, TV shows, doing call-in shows, and then doing readings. And um, in the early days, I never had enough money for you know, my expenses to the first town. So I'd, I'd, I'd go to a, a city where I could just do a quick few readings and then have my front money for the next city. And I was in Barrie, Ontario, and I was doing some readings. And the police came to my door at the hotel, knocked on my door. It was late at night. And they wanted me um, to work on this case where a woman had disappeared. And I didn't want to do it and and because I wanted to do readings. And they told me that if I didn't help them, they wouldn't let me do readings in the in the city. Mm. And I hadn't paid my hotel bill, so I, you know, I didn't have the money until I'd finished the readings. You were blackmailed. You bet. And so um, I had then heard there was a um, I had heard that there was this woman because it made the news in Toronto, and she was this very upstanding, really healthy mother um, of a beautiful son. And she had a day off. She took her son to the daycare and she went to the mall to have um, her hair cut. And um, her car was found outside the mall where the hair, the hair salon was, but she never made it into the hair salon. The child was dropped off at the daycare and, and um, nobody had, have, had seen her ever again. And this had been going on for a while and they had no leads and they were taking a shot at let's, let's see if we can, they, and, and they heard me on the radio and Barry that day and they, they wanted me to try. So that night they came back and I, again, I was taken down to the police station 
and we looked at maps and I said to them, you're not going to find her now. Uh, you're not going to find her right now. You're not going to find her until next spring. But um, where you'll be able to find her is there will be an old train trestle. And on the train trestle, it's not used anymore. But on the train trestle, you'll see stamp 1910. And um, they got all excited about that. And then we looked at maps. And, and in the middle of the night that night, we went out in the woods looking for that train trestle. And we found the train trestle. But the next day they did, um, they searched the area, couldn't find anything. But um, when it came springtime and everything melted, um, they did another search and they found her remains within about 50 meters of where um, the train trestle was. Um, they phoned me and told me. <clears throat> So was there snow or ice or what was what was preventing them from finding her when you look? Her body her? had been there for six or seven months anyway. Okay. It was so, you know, she, her, you know, her body probably been consumed by other predators mm -hmm. and they just found bones. Okay. And, and like, um, I, I didn't see that part. Okay. Mm. Ooh. That was that was one, and I do stuff like that, but the guarantee I have to have a guarantee, and and the guarantee is that, well, I don't get paid for it, but um, the other one is is um, nobody can know a psychic has done this, and 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 I will be given anonymity that nobody will know. Okay. that I've done it and and because um I don't want to do that I don't want to do those things because most of the people you look for are dead mm -hmm. and I don't have what it takes to tell somebody their child is dead I just don't have it mm -hmm. so I I don't really talk about it very much I I don't volunteer and the only time I get involved is when somebody, you know, I get forced to do it. Right. Have you ever had an intuition or, you know, a feeling that that a child, a missing child was someplace other than, you know, uh, where they were left murdered? No. Okay. Uh, okay. I've seen I've seen the, the, the ones that I've worked on. Um, usually what happens when psychics get involved in something like this, it's, it's when, um, that's the last, uh, effort, you know, the last ch chance. The family just wants, wants closure. And, and I never deal with the families. Uh, I, I, you know, the only time I do this is when, you know, the police come and grab me and say, hey, mm. you got to do this. That's so hard. Do you feel, did you feel the energy of this woman or you just saw the bones? I was detached um, and I didn't even see, I didn't even see, I, 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 it, it's more, I know, as opposed to, I see. Okay. All right. Very cool. Because I don't want to see that stuff. Yeah. I wouldn't want to either. <clears throat> so, um, so you're currently doing readings and you, you do them remotely. I do. Um, I, I, I still do uh, in person, but not very many. And, and I'm, I'm still doing these. By the way, um, I do something unusual that I've never met anybody in my field that does. What is that? I guarantee my work. Wow. Absolutely forever. If I did a reading for you in 1985 and you bump into me today and you say, you did a reading for me in 1985 and it was really lousy. I say, I am so sorry. Here's your money back. Wow. They don't get today's money back. They get they get the the initial fee, they, they, and I I guarantee it. Mm -hmm. Absolute no questions asked. Mm -hmm. And in those days, in those early days, you had to give me back the recording. Oh, that's another thing. I never do anything unless it's recorded. Mm -hmm. So they had to give me back the recording now because it's 
you know, we do it online. I just give them back their money. Well, interesting. Well, <clears throat> from what I know, or from what I've understood about psychic readings is that there's always, things can always change. Indeed so. so. So what you're seeing in the future is not guaranteed to be in the future. Absolutely. That's true. Okay. That's true. Okay. So the guarantee that I give mm -hmm. is that the reading I do, that person will believe that they receive full value and benefit of the reading. And for whatever reason, um, they don't feel that way or satisfied, I give them back their money. Gotcha, gotcha. And I don't get into fights or arguments about it, I just do it. Okay. That's they don't get another reading from me. They just get their their money back from what I just they paid make, back then. That's right. correct. And I and I give them the balance. Mm -hmm. I balance the energy. Yeah. Okay. That sounds great. Um, what is your website? Do you have one? Yep, I do. It's uh robertlindsaymilne.com www.robertlindsaymilne.com okay and um people can book sessions with you readings indeed with you? so Con you that. can contact me um through through my website i have an assistant now where um and uh we we, we contact people right away and uh, schedule appointments are you um backed up or, or are you pretty current yes um i um I'm I I have um I I I'm booked in advance, but okay. but if there's an emergency, we I I always find a time. If something's really important or whatever. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed hearing you, hearing your stories, and hearing about what you do. Thank you. It's very fascinating. I'm and I'm really glad that we got to to chat today. Thank you. I'm privileged to be on your show. Thank you so much. And and you just quickly, you have your own podcast called My Side of the Crystal Ball. How do we listen That's, to that? You can find it <clears throat> on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, um, Paranormal, uh, UK Paranormal, um, and pretty much anywhere else your uh, podcast. You, okay. you listen to and your My podcast. Side of the Crystal Ball podcast. My okay. Side of the Crystal Ball. Yes. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. It's been great talking to you. Thank you. Take care. <clears throat>